So, hi everybody. I'm Cameron Beccario. Um, I'm a software engineer and uh, sorry for, I've got a cold, so I don't normally sound like this and hopefully I can last it through. Um, so what is Earth? Earth is the project that I wrote last fall. Um, it's a website that shows an animated map of the entire globe, uh, showing wind conditions, ocean conditions, and other weather uh, conditions. And over the next 17 hours, we're going to discuss in detail uh, everything about this project. So relax. Um, today, talk about motivations, construction, reactions, and lessons. Um, so, but before we get into that, just a quick intro about me. I'm originally from Cedar Rapids, Iowa, which is this small state right here. Lots of corn, lots of pigs. Um, it looks close to Chicago, it's not. That's like a five hour drive. I got my uh, bachelor's degree in computer engineering from Iowa State University. And after uh, graduating college, I went to Microsoft in Seattle, where I worked on the Visual Basic compiler team helping to ship the first couple versions of .NET when that was a new thing. Uh, after doing that for about five years, I decided that I wanted to do something completely different. So I moved to Japan, quit my job, moved to Japan, and studied Japanese full-time for a year. And after getting settled in, I joined a um, financial services company called Trading Screen, where we built a stock trading platform did that for a number of years, quit the job, and joined recently in April a company called Indeed, which is a job search engine. If you're looking for a job, go to indeed.com. So, motivations. In the summer of 2013, I had no job, and I collected stamps. Stamps, okay? Um, <laughs> I want you to impress. My girlfriend threatened to kick me out of the apartment or send letters to a lot of random people using up my precious stamps. <laughs> um, so, and she was right, I needed a new project. I needed something to do other than sit around in my pajamas all day looking at stamps. Um, incidentally, if you wanna talk about stamps after the talk, <laughs> please, they're really, really amazing. Anyway, so, uh, I needed a new project. I needed new skills. Uh, being unemployed meant having to find a new job eventually, and that meant uh, having to put together a CV, everything. And I had been primarily a developer tools guy, a server-side you know, developer. I had no HTML5 experience, no JavaScript experience. Node was a thing. I had no idea what that was. And I'd always been interested in data visualization, but I'd never done any. And so I thought these would be really good skills to, to develop and put on a CV. So uh, the question was what to build. What, what would be a good idea to build to, to develop these skills? So I took a number of uh, inspirations that I had seen um, in the previous years. This uh, hint.fn wind map was released in 2013, or 2012, sorry by Fernanda Villegas and Martin Wattenberg, who are now at Google. And it's a, I hope you can see it a bit. Um, you might also have already seen it. It's already been presented at the conference yesterday. It's an animated wind map of live wind conditions over the United States, updated every hour. And when I saw that, I thought, how are they doing that in the browser? That's amazing. I mean, this is 2012, right? Um, it really stuck in my mind as something that looked fascinating. I'd also remembered being on a business trip to London in 2009 and seeing uh, the BBC weather. And they have a, 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 the same kind of technique of using animated wind streams to show, um, to show the weather, right? And I remember that, that moment I saw that, it really stuck in my mind. Like, how are they doing, what is that? And actually, this technique's been used by the BBC for quite a while. Um, this is from 2000. 
It, it's a little less sophisticated, <laughs> but it's the same idea, right? Uh, I thought that was really cool to focus on and say, that's a nice visualization to, to work on. Also, weather is really awesome. In fact, it's so awesome, I'm going to get rid of that title. This is Typhoon Neoguri, which um, hit Japan in July of this year. That's when it's explosively intensifying to a cata category, uh, equivalent category five hurricane. And when you think about weather, I mean, it's universal to human existence. I mean, we all operate in the fabric of weather, right? It's the universal icebreaker. You can talk to anybody worldwide about the weather. And we'll probably be talking about the weather tonight on the boat, because there's a lot of weather here in the UK. <laughs> I've, dis <laughs> I've discovered in the last week. I thought it was supposed to be summer. Unfortunately, the weather media tends to be just numbers in boxes, right? Like you can distill the entire Earth's atmosphere down to one box, one number. Oh, it's going to be 30, 30 degrees, right? I think you lose a lot with that. Or just these static windows, right? Someone somewhere decided that this is the boundary of map uh, weather data that you're going to see. Well, OK, so what, what, what are these things? I mean, what's, what's around here? Like, why, don't, why aren't you showing me that? What do I, where do I go to see that? There are a few places you can go to see that now. But primarily, it's very driven. Right? The, the weather narrative that is given to you is driven uh, along a certain route. So I thought this would be a great project. Using those wind maps as an inspiration, why not build a global wind map? Sounds like a good way to learn these, these uh, technologies. So I started out doing a little investigation. I had literally no Java experience. I did not, I'm kind of ashamed to say this, <laughs> No, I had no idea what SVG was. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, I knew what, uh, yeah, anyway. And thankfully, one of the first sites I ran into was this tutorial written by Mike Bostock, Let's Make a Map, using D3 and TopoJSON. You just follow right through and create a nice, a nice map in the browser. In fact, I think somewhere Scott Murray is mentioned right there. <laughs> and I'm sure this is all built on Jason's stuff, right? <coughs> so I thought, wow, that's, this is exactly what I need. This is the tutorial that I need to follow. And I also saw, look, well, Natural Earth. It's a website that, sh that provides, uh, or will, there we go provides public domain geographic data for the entire planet. One of the big concerns I had about this project when I started out was what are the kinds of IP and copyright roadblocks am I going to hit along the way, right? Because that will just stop me in my tracks. I won't be able to get anywhere. But thankfully, I was so happy to find uh, reference from that, from that tutorial from Mike Bostock, Natural Earth data being publicly uh, available. The next big challenge was trying to find the weather data for the entire planet. Um, I thought for certain this would be the hardest, hardest thing to, to figure out. But actually, after doing a little investigation on Google, Wikipedia, I found that the US National Weather Service has a product called the GFS, the Global Forecast System. This is a um, numerical weather model, which is run every six hours on their supercomputers. It incorporates all sensor data worldwide that they can get their hands on, satellite data, and they run it through effectively a mathematical model, and it produces a forecast, a weather forecast, every six hours. In fact, the, uh, and, and the best part is it's public domain. It's completely open. You can do whatever you want with it. Here's the repository of all the files. This is their actual web server. We can just jump down to the bottom, say, look at the most recent run of the GFS. Here's all the files that it make up that run. You just download them. It's 
megas and gigs and gigs and gigs of data every six hours. So that was a really, really great find to be able to find that data because now I knew like the impossible is now possible. It's just a matter of crunching through and working on that uh, on the technology side. So construction. This was the first moment I got the natural earth data up and showing in a Mercator projection. And this was, I was so happy to see this. <laughs> you know, uh, I had no browser programming experience at all. And to be able to get this far um, by following that, by following that uh, tutorial really like made me happy. But I needed a globe, not a flat Mercator projection. So switched over to a ortho orthogonal, uh, orthographic projection. <laughs> And as the next step said, well, the weather data is provided from the GFS as a grid of lat long data points, right? So it's a nice big lat long grid. And I thought I can at least, I don't know how to decode that yet. That's a later step. But I can at least paint the location of those data points around the grid, uh, around the globe. And this was the first initial attempt to do that. There's some issues with clipping over here. You can see both poles. The globe is transparent. I had to figure that out. But after a little while, I uh, got to the point where yeah, I had a nice uh, globe with all the data points uh, plotted on it. The next step was then to decode that uh, GFS file. The, it's a GRIB format, gridded binary format. It's a standard. Decode that and then color the, the data points, not just as white, but as you know, uh, a color based on the um, magnitude of the wind speed. So that was the next step. Uh, the data points are, I use a data set which is one degree. So it's one degree lat long. Every one degree lat long, there's a data point available. So that's not dense enough to cover the whole, to, to paint the whole uh, globe. So I needed to fill in the gaps in between the points and did a little investigation. Uh, oh, bino bilinear interpolation, that'll probably work. Let's give that a try. And the result looked like this. I had a nice, finally, nice, smooth sphere with solid colors. But animation part was yet to come, and I had no idea how to do that. <laughs> So I tried a number of things to be able to wrap my head around what's going on. <laughs> um, drawing some lines to represent uh, the vector fields of the wind along the globe. This didn't end up being very useful, but I thought it was pretty cool. Um, along the way, hit some interesting visualization bugs. Um, I highly recommend when you build your own visualizations, take snapshots along the way. It's like Command Shift 3 on a Mac. You, you'll be able to capture cool stuff like this and see your progress along the way. Highly recommend it. Anyway, after a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, and coffee, finally got to the point where I could have particles moving around on the map, kind of showing um, the, the, the direction of the wind and I thought, well, this is, this is good. So just give a quick demo. Um, is it, has anyone seen this before by chance or not seen it? How about not seen it? Excellent. OK, so this is the final product. You're presented with a globe. Oh. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, you're presented with a globe very clean with the wind, uh, current wind conditions. This is, I, I downloaded this data yesterday, so this is yesterday's data. You can uh, click and drag the globe if you want. Um, let's, you can zoom in. Let's take a look at all the little swirlies going around today in the northern Atlantic. This is our weather system that's giving us trouble lately. This is a hurricane. Hurricane Crystal Ball. I don't know how to pronounce the name. Um, 
you can click anywhere on the map, and a local pop-up shows up that shows uh, the speed of the wind at that point. And if you don't like metric, well, you can switch through various units, knots, miles per hour. Clear the call out. You can also click on Earth to have a map, uh, a menu show up with all extra um, features available. It shows the date of the data that you're looking at, shows the kind of data, a color scale, which I, I hate color scales because how do I know um, the exact value for an exact you know, color? So just hover and it tells you the exact value at that color point. Um, there's a lot of data in the GFS files. Um, not just surface winds, but also winds going up in altitude. Meteorologists like to use pressure instead of meters above surface uh, as a representation of altitude. So as you go up in the atmosphere, the air pressure drops. So that's why um, these numbers go down. So this is hectopascals. So we can, we can just go up and start going up in altitude. 1,000 hectopascals is about 100 meters. 850, 700. We're approaching the jet stream now. 500, 250 hectopascals is where the jet stream is usually, and it's kind of interesting to see, see it snaking around, doing its thing. I like going up even further into the, strat into the stratosphere 70 hectopascals, I think 10, this is when things really start to change. 10 hectopascals is about 30 kilometers. The wind is very different up here. Um, right now, the southern, southern hemisphere is in winter, so over Antarctica, there's a polar vortex that sets up. See that there? That actually migrates over to the North Pole during the winter in the northern hemisphere. And that made news last year, last winter, because parts of it would dip down and bring really, really bitter cold over the United States. I think that was in January or something. Uh, we don't have to just look at wind. We can look at lots of things. Temperature. Let's zoom this up a little bit. Temperature, relative humidity, um, total precipitable water, which is the amount of water in a column of air. So if you were to take it all and put it into a big jug, how much would you have? Uh, let's see. Hurricanes are pretty moist. <laughs> so <laughs> what a terrible word, right? Moist. I apologize. 71 kilograms per square meter of water. Uh, we can also look at cloud water. Not all the, so this is the amount of water that's actually um, shown as clouds. Or we can also look at mean sea level pressure, which is the standard high-low uh, maps you would see. But I chose a color scheme to show lows as being like holes in, a, in otherwise a smooth uh, surface. And I added this one recently. That I call this the misery index. <laughs> this is uh, what the temperature feels like to a human. Um, so it's a combination of heat index and wind chill on one map. It's a little subjective, the coloring here. Like, but I tried to follow you know, what when, when um, heat stroke might set in or, or frostbite. Down here in Antarctica, it's a bit cold, negative 72 C or negative uh, 100 F. It's pretty cold. Um, let's see. Let's go back to wind. You don't have to use just or uh, look at just an orthographic projection. We can do lots of other cool stuff because it's all built into D3. Thank you, Jason. Conic. Equidistant projection, equirectangular projection. I like the waterman butterfly. It's kind of cool. 
you can even do this. Not sure why you'd want to, but it just falls out. It just fell out of the, the implementation. I started dragging the, the globe and went, whoa. Um, and there's a few, um, let's go back to this. There's a few other controls here to go backwards and forwards in time. And you can also paint the location of the grid points that's actually coming down from the GFS. Everything in between is interpolated. Okay. Uh, there's also a Japanese version too because I live in Japan and why not? Okay. So, I wanted to go in a little in depth into how the particle animation works. So let's just start with a plain vector field. A uh, vector field is just every point that's going to describe a motion, like what direction you should be going when you're located here. So let's draw a particle one segment at a time. Every segment we say where, as a particle, you say where am I now, uh, what vector is underneath me, uh, and then draw a line, not a long one, just a short one, draw a short line in that direction and repeat. To make it a bit more particle-like, let's fade each previously drawn segment. And now we have like a little comet tail setting up. If we increase the speed, it becomes more obvious. It helps with the visualization to have the particles age. And when they get too old, just spawn them in a random place. This helps when they hit a border or when they get stuck in a little vortex. So let's increase the number of uh, particles, increase it even more, increase their speed. And by the end of it, we've got a fully animated vector field. And the shape of this field is now completely undeniable, right? It's circular, might be a hur hurricane or something like that. OK. But the hardest part of this project was figuring out how that animation is distorted by the underlying projection. Um, and to demonstrate how that's done, let's take a look at the orthographic projection. It's just a standard globe. These red lines represent the direction of north at each point. I can't just draw a line. If I have northern, northernly moving wind, I just can't draw a line going straight up on the screen. I have to be sensitive to the underlying projection. So over here, north is going up into the east, up into the left, or right. And over here, north is going down into the left. East is the same kind of deal. Um, moving east means drawing a line almost straight down when you're over here, and drawing a line upwards over here. So what we need to do is, along each point of the projection, effectively calculate um, the direction of north and the direction of east at each point. We do that everywhere and we get effectively a, we, we know now the shape of the distortion. And we can apply that to the, the, the wind data to be able to, pl to plot the particles. So let's just take eastwardly motion as, a, as an example vector field. And we're going to use the same technique we just looked at. Draw a particle one segment at a time, increase the speed, Let's add a bit more, and then finally, we have a whole uh, eastwardly moving sphere. Um, the particle like animation algorithm doesn't really care if the underlying vector field is static or dynamic, so it just adapts to whatever uh, vectors are currently um, currently underneath the location of each particle. So we can just take the ve vector field and start rotating it. And the particles just automatically adapt. As long as we don't move it too fast, this works out. Um, if we move it too fast, this, the pole region starts getting really strange. So that's basically how the, the distortion was managed with this. The image itself is composed of four elements. Um, we've got a base SVG layer, which uses D3Geo to um, 
draw the natural earth data uh, coastlines. Then on top of that, layered on top of that is an HTML5 canvas where all the particle animations are drawn. Layered on top of that is, the, is another canvas for the colored overlay. In this case, wind speed, but if it's temperature, it's temperature or whatever. And then finally, a, another SVG uh, layer on, sitting on top, which is just a bounding circle. It's about two, three pixels wide. All its purpose is just to clean up the edges uh, so they look nice, because otherwise you get some jaggies and it doesn't look very good, so. And they're just layered right on top of each other. I want to talk a little bit, about, a little bit about the design considerations that I took to to build the site. I wanted people people to visit the site and not know if they were looking at something scientific or look at something artistic. Um, I didn't want ads or social buttons. Um, I wanted the minimum amount of text because I wanted people from all over the world to visit the site and not be confused. So lots of numbers. Numbers are universal as little text as possible, if I can get away with it. Also, um, there are no political borders on here as well. Um, I don't understand what political borders have to do with the weather, and sim similar with city names. It also opens up issues with localization, so I just said, well, let's just get rid of all that. But put in some rivers and some lakes so you can have at least some orientation as to where you might be located. Also, um, I wanted the globe to face, it be relevant, its orientation, default orientation, to be relevant to visitors when they, when they visit. Um, so how do I find out where they are without you know, asking for their specific lat long, right? Because you get an annoying dialogue to pop up. And I didn't want to call out to like an IP geocoding service. So I just said, let's use the time zone of the, the user and rotate the globe roughly to where they probably are. And that ends up working out pretty OK. This is a topology of how the, the site is constructed behind the scenes. And we've got, on the left-hand side is Nomads. That's the name of the um, U.S. National Weather Service uh, file repository serving all of those GFS GRIB files. In the middle is a server that I rent from a, from a hosting s uh, service called DigitalOcean. Um, I call that server Gaia, which stands for Global Atmospheric Information Assimilator, and I made that up for the talk. I did call it Gaia, though. Um, I use Node.js to do all the, the file transfers and compression. Uh, cracking open the GRIB files meant using a library called NetCDF Java, which is available from uh, an organization called Unidata. It's open source uh, framework, and it decodes GRIB, which is great. I just wrote a little Java utility to pull out the layers I wanted and spit them out in JSON format. All of these JSON files are then uploaded straight to Amazon S3. I chose Amazon S3 because they have like a free version for a year and they scale to petabytes, so no need to worry about storage there. Uh, and also they have flip of a switch, turn on static hosting and they'll just serve anything over HTTP, it's great. But they are a bit expensive, so I found a service called Cloudflare, which is a CDN, um, content delivery network. They have data centers all over the world, and they cache um, the content of your site and serve it from their cache. So they sit in front of your site, and they're free. Bandwidth is free. If I wanted things like HTTPS or advanced statistics on traffic, et cetera, then you pay, but otherwise it's free. And then finally over here you have the browser, and the browser is using D3 to render everything as we, we talked about. Um, when a user visits the site, 
and they start clicking through all the different layers. When they click through those layers, what's happening is the browser is just making a request for that specific JSON file. It's not reloading the whole page. And if Cloudflare happens to have that cached, great. It goes straight back to them. Otherwise, Cloudflare dives down to S3 and it comes back up. Um, so, designed the site to be scalable because it was fun. Also, I thought, well, I don't want it to die, right, if, if it becomes popular. So, well, the question was, would anyone visit? So, reactions. To launch the site, I tweeted about it, set up a Facebook page, which had zero likes, of course, at the beginning, and told my friends. And just sat back and waited and saw what happened. I wasn't sure what was going to happen. This is uh, Google Analytics, first couple days. Um, it's a few small peaks here for the first couple days. That's me hitting the site. That's probably my girlfriend, that's <laughs> my dad. And then something happened, hey, uh, maybe a mailing list, everyone woke up in the States or something. And I got 64 hits in one hour, great. And it collapsed back down to zero. And I thought, well, that was fun. <laughs> cool. But fast forward, um, Extend this graph a few, and keep your eye on this number. If you can read it, it says 80. Um, this went, this was 10 days, and I had a peak of 30,000 sessions per hour, and 500,000 users, 700,000 unique sessions. Um, so things really kicked up, <laughs> which was nice. Extending out from December 9th, which was the release date, out to February 28th, 3 million users, 6 million sessions. I don't believe the page views. I only have one page. How, <laughs> How can it be 1.3 pages per session? I don't understand what Google is doing there. <laughs> but um, you'll notice a little, a, a huge spike, 300,000 sessions in this one day from February 13th. That's because... Uh, there was a really bad windstorm here in the UK, really bad flooding and everything, and the, uh, the Daily Mail decided to iframe embed my site in their top story. And of course it's a massive, massive, you know, article. I think somewhere down here. Oh, there, oh, there it is. Iframe embedded, you can see it's at. That, that counts as a hit. And at first I, th I was really angry about this. Like, it's really presumptuous of them. They could have brought my site down, right? Or at least cost me huge amounts of bandwidth. And then I remembered Cloudflare's free. Ah, I don't care, whatever. <laughs> the only thing that's annoying is that the, um, the statistics on traffic are, are tainted, right? Because this counts as a visit, but I mean, people don't know they're really visiting. Right. Incidentally, this is what this is what the site looked like. This is what the weather looked like at that time. It's pretty bad. Uh, this is traffic from December 9th up until a couple weeks ago. Fourteen and a half million sessions, six point six million unique users, and you see spikes along the way. Those are generally hurricanes. Um, some kind of massive weather event occurring somewhere on the planet. May and June, really boring. <laughs> Nothing happened. I thought, well, that's it for the site. Nothing's going to happen after this. And then summer kicked in in the whole typhoon season. I really liked seeing the responses on Twitter. Uh, World Meteorological Organization, Chris Hadfield, um, Al Gore, tweeted about the site. He was one of the first, actually. This happened three in the morning when I thought my site was being denial of service <laughs> attacked. And um, I had to 
I had to uh, board a flight to the States in like eight hours. And then I saw he had tweeted about the site and I thought, well, I'm, that's it, I'm not getting any sleep. TV stations started calling and asking, can we you know, use this on the air? I'm like, yeah, go for it. You know, just put attribution, I don't mind. This is some Japanese sites, or Japanese channels. This is Sky News. <laughs> um, this is Weather Channel in the States. Hey, I got published in Science Magazine <laughs> um, as an accompanying uh, illustration to an article that was written by a few researchers at Colorado State University, I believe it was. Um, you can even see on the side, earth.nullschool.net. At this point, I realized, why did I choose Null School <laughs> as a domain name? That was really dumb. But it was, an, it, was a no <laughs> it was a domain name I had for like 10 years and I was just lazy to make a new one, so I just put the site on there. Oh well. I r all the source code is up on GitHub and it's MIT licensed, so I really like seeing the spin-off services, or the spin-off um, projects. This one here is Bird Migration Flow, um, made by these guys. It's a nice map of Canada. I'm joking. <laughs> it's, uh, what is it? What is it actually? <laughs> Netherlands. I knew that. Oh, it's Belgium. You can tell um, I'm American. <laughs> this one I really like. It's a whale tracking map. Um, this is actually a spin off of a spin off. Esri, someone at Esri. Took the took my source code and distilled it down to like its most most basic form, and then made it work on top of um, their technology. And then this team took that and turned it into uh, a map showing whale locations around Hawaii. And it might be a little dim, but you can see ocean currents. I did. I did, forgot to show you in the demo. There's also ocean currents you can see, uh, updated every every day, or every five days. This was a neat one. Uh, the Newport Bermuda race made a map that layered my ocean map on top of Google Maps, and then on top of that they layered the location of their boats during the race. I thought that was really cool, and I have no idea how they did this. That's really impressive. <laughs> there are some really, really great art and, and cool images made by people out in the community. Uh, a lot of people uh, compare the site often to Starry Night. So someone, of course, made that. An artist in Montreal, uh, Bettina Matsun, made a one meter wide embroidered, hand embroidered piece uh, that was inspired by the shape of the wind map. In fact, this is using the Waterman butterfly projection. Uh, actually, interesting story. Uh, shortly after launch, I got an email from a guy named Steve Waterman, and he's like, thank you for using my projection in your project. And I'm like, what? <laughs> you're a you're a, like a guy that what? I thought all cart I thought all map projections were invented 200 years ago. <laughs> uh, but no, apparently cartography is kind of a thing still. <laughs> so that was really cool. He sent a, an autographed uh, print of his of his map. Um, lessons. Okay, so usability. What menu? <laughs> Many people who visit the site have no idea there's a menu. And I thought I was being really clever when I created the, the design. I thought, well, I'll reward people for digging around and finding features as they uncover layers of functionality and 
that'll be nice and great. And actually, most people have no idea the menu's there. They actually don't even know you can rotate the globe, which is, which is a failure, right? It's a failure on my part because, you know, I think it makes sense to have the site be somewhat, you know, um, rewarding is the wrong word, but engaging as people dig deeper, but to have the bulk of the functionality be so hidden, right, is, is a failure. Also, who thinks that the map is showing wind as it moves over time? Probably most people. That is not what it shows. So there's a very big misperception here with this visualization. In fluid dynamics, there's a concept of streamlines and path lines. So let's take a look at what that is. This is that visualization we were just looking at. This is uh, that um, animated vector field, circular, of a hurricane. This is a snapshot in time. This is, the clock's not moving. So, uh, the clock's not moving. So, uh, what you're looking at is an animation, not through time, but around the vector field, right? Let's draw, a, let's just put, put a focus on one particle and draw its stream. And it's circular, right? So you might think if you're looking at this, oh, the wind's moving in a circular fashion. <coughs> so keep that shape in mind. Most hurricanes move, like this one, to the east. Over time, the clock's moving now. Okay, so here's the wind following that hurricane as it moves to the east. Let's draw the same particle, but this time we're going to draw its path as it moves through time. Totally different. This is what people think they're seeing. This is what they're trained to see. This is what, as humans, we perceive animation as being through time. And I'm showing them a wind map that is not that. And that is really concerning, right? I don't really know how to, um, how to communicate this, right, in a nice and easy way. I sometimes get emails from sailors that say, I used your map to save two days off my travel. And I think, that's awesome. And then I go, no, what? <laughs> that's really scary. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, <laughs> I have a disclaimer but on, on the site, but uh, here's the thing. People will implicitly trust you if you put something up. At least they trusted this. I don't know why. Maybe because it looked cool or whatever. They thought it was real. Um, and to a certain extent, I, I mean, it is real. You know, path lines versus streamlines, that's, a, that's an actual thing in fluid dynamics. Me meteorologists use that information, right? They use that distinction. But it, it was a little scary to see how, um, how eager people visiting the site would grant you authority in correctness. And I'm, I mean, I've had bugs, right? I've had issues where the visualization is not showing correct weather conditions. So what responsibility do I have to make sure that that's correct, right? I try my best. Lesson three, free, free geographic data. Free frameworks, free bandwidth, free help, Wikipedia, Stack Overflow, the, all the awesome uh, examples for D3, right? None of this project would have been possible without that. None of it. I wouldn't even have known where to start, especially with weather data. I mean, this is data that cost literally billions of dollars to produce, billions. Rockets, launches, um, 
satellites, supercomputers, all the scientists, all the research. And here I am, just a dev sitting in his pajamas in Tokyo, you know, like, oh, look at this. <laughs> right, wow, billions of dollars worth of data. I can do something with that. <laughs> very, very important, right? I understand, um, I, of course, it's not free, right? It is taxpayer funded. But um, it's a really important point. Like, n there are a ton of projects out there that would not be happening or aren't happening because data is, uh, taxpayer-funded taxpayer data is locked up in copyright or locked behind a door or, you know, disseminated only to researchers because, right, they're the only ones who know how to interpret it. Well, just open it up. See what happens. Thank you. How is that on time? Where did you learn your uh, maths? <laughs> <laughs> Jason Davies. <laughs> um, I'm guessing there might be a question or two. Who's going to go first? So how do you think qualitatively it would change if you did have access to time-dependent wind data? Would it, I mean, at the moment, every six hours, yep. you bring in the new field and, and you're displaying that, yep. that static snapshot. What would it take for you to have that, or for somebody to have right. a, a dynamically updating version of this? More technical know-how than I have at the <laughs> moment. I want to be able to do that. I want to be able to say, well, just play, a, you know, play the an evolution over time of the weather systems. You know, because there are the forecast is there, right? Yeah. The forecast data is there, but it's on a scale that I don't know how to handle. As you saw during the demo, as I'm changing the orientation of the globe, there's a pause right. where it's reinterpolating everything based on the uh, orientation of the globe and the distortion caused by that. And I don't know how to make that faster. Okay. And, uh, and I so want to. I want to know how to make that faster. Okay. We should talk about that. Um, just the other thing then is, is when it changes focus, when you, when you zoom in on an area, Yep. and you're only rendering that. I mean, you're, are you picking that up for free from the, from, from the graphics library or, or something? It knows how to do that already? Uh, pretty much. Yeah. Yep, exactly. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Very good. Um, I wonder if it's possible to, to get uh, past data archive. I mean, you showed examples, yeah. but is it uh, possible for any day in the past so couple of months? Or? Uh, I have data on the site back to November of 2013. And I saw somewhere in my travels around the GFS websites uh, an archive of data going back a decade. I haven't encountered that since. I want to find that. And I also know that the uh, ECMWF also has like a reanalysis uh, uh, weather data that goes back to 1983, but those are more like daily averages. That would be fun to uh, put that up on the site. And that is free, I believe, I believe. Hi, so first of all, thank you because I'm, I'm by training a scientist and I have spent most of my life actually programming the models that do all the weather forecast and climate forecast and so on. Nice. So it's, pretty, it's pretty cool to see that you're <laughs> using the, the data. But one, one suggestion in terms of this issue between the, the forecast and, and the data, because you are displaying a snapshot, and traditionally what we do with this is simply to call it an analysis to disencourage people from thinking that that's a forecast, just to say, okay, this is a single point in time. You have Look a... At it. This is very cool, but this is just an analysis. This is just a picture of what it is now. Yeah, yeah, you know, um, I'm torn, right? Like, how much text do I want to put on the page at the beginning to say, oh, big dis disclaimer, uh, right? 
kind of defeats the aesthetic, you know, uh, uh, part of this. But I know exactly what you mean. Like, I need to do something, right? No, but very happy to work with you. I mean, we have lots of data. And yeah, as you say, we have analysis, reanalysis, and so on. And yeah. Happy to show what we do in-house for our forecasters. Yeah, yeah. Apparently, apparently there's a lot of in-house data, which is much, much finer detail than what's released. That'd be cool. Um, I have two short questions. So the first one is, I'm amazed that you taught yourself everything to build this. Like, it's astounding. And so related to that, how long did it take you to make it, going yeah. from nothing to amazing viral yeah. success? And then the second question is, do you have any plans to try to fix the UI problems, the usability, or are you just so sick of this after doing this? <laughs> <laughs> Never again. So um, there are, I think, as a software engineer, skills that translate domains, right? So I had done a lot of engineering, you know, and server-side stuff, um, a, you know, algorithm, algorithms, et cetera. Those translate easily to, you know, other languages, right? So it was just a matter of learning, you know, JavaScript. And, and I had also done compilers and, and languages before, so I was familiar with a lot of the details around computer languages. Um, I mean, it was still a struggle. It was a big struggle, right? CSS, it's kind of weird. Um, HTML. I didn't put up a prototype project I worked on, which was a map of the air over Tokyo and pollution over Tokyo. That was a very, very simple prototype. Um, I started on that in July of last year. And I had shipped this in December, so it, actually, it took five months of sitting in, in, in my pajamas, basically. <laughs> so what about the usability? Oh, I usability, I want to fix that. Hey, um, just a quick question around the uh, canvas layer. Yeah. So when you zoom in, do you have like uh, any problems on like rendering, like quality of the of your rendering? Like, did you have to go around that, or is that? Well, zooming in is basically just clearing the canvas and starting over. Um, I didn't have any issues because every time you zoom, the the projection, the D three projection, is just in a different state. And so for every x, y pixel, just <laughs> walk the whole canvas and go, what am I, what, should, what color should I be here, right? So it's, in some sense, because of the interpolation, it's infinitely zoomable. Um, just the canvas is the viewport. Cool, thanks. Are you aware of the, uh, of the literature in flow visualization that's nope. out there? So there, <laughs> is, there, there is a literature. <laughs> mm. It's been around for a while. It's a part of scientific visualization. And um, there is, and this is where many of these techniques come from. This is also where the original wind map comes from because it's a technique that's called, I think this is the one that's called LIC, L-I-C, Line Integral Convolution. Yeah, I've heard that. And the, there is a lot of work on, first of all, there is a big discussion, that's actually interesting that you raised that, on animation for static fields or not. I'm not sure if it's actually in papers or just people yelling at each other th at these conferences, <laughs> but it's something that people have discussed for a while, of course. But there is work on things like um, like particle seeding and, and things like that to, to get a good coverage without them all overlapping and yeah. Reseeding them so that you're filling gaps between others that have died and so on. So there's, there's a lot of work that that's been done in that in that. Yeah, direction. yeah. I, along the edges, you might have noticed the particles' density is not as thick as it should be, right, because so the animation the has a bias to. The same. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Yes, exactly. Uh, I also took an engineering point. perspective. I'm like, I just want something up. <laughs> Not perfect. Um, I would love to read that stuff. I can give you some pointers. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks, that was an amazing presentation. I'm interested, oh, what's you. been the impact on you in terms of job opportunities and whether your girlfriend through uh, you? <laughs> Uh, impact on me is um, I'm in the UK. <laughs> I got invited to come out here, and it was really, really cool. Um, I think it helped find me the job that I have now. Other people have offered jobs as well, or like, oh, let's go to let's work together on a project or something. But um, yeah, you know, I'm look. I was looking more for something full-time and in, in an established type company but it, I think it did help um, other than that I spend a really large amount of time looking at Google Analytics and looking at the weather <laughs> etc so it, it has changed me Good. How is your stamp collection? <laughs> I've had to put that on hold but I'm eager to get back to it <laughs> at some point, maybe in retirement. Do you want a job at Google? <laughs> <laughs> I had, uh, <laughs> um, we can chat after. <laughs> There's a story there. <laughs> Any other questions for Cameron? Okay, well, we'll take a wrap here. Can we just show our appreciation again? Thank you.